Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching The Reds Report. I am Chris Vidyard. Uh, alongside me, as always, my good friend, Carol Van der Water. You right, Carol? I'm not too bad. D-Day is coming ever so nearer. Yes, yes, tomorrow. We're getting very close and there's only a few nails left. Uh, I'm sure I'll finish him off tomorrow, Carol. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, also with us, uh, making his debut this season, uh, Andy Giddens from the BBC Radio Sheffield. Yeah, Andy, nice to see you. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm good, thanks. Yep, yep. Uh, you are probably one of the busiest men in, in, in South Yorkshire, I would argue, uh, for the past five, six, seven weeks. You must be looking forward to the end in sight, Andy. You might get a summer holiday for, for a week or so. Well, you never know. I might get a couple of days, but is the end in sight? Is it really? <laughs> Are we all going to swear on that? We're going to come on to that, I promise you. <laughs> also with us, we have Billy Grant uh, from the Besotted Brentford podcast. Billy, nice to see you. Are you well? Yeah, good, man. Thanks for having me on, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, no, it's a real pleasure, mate. It's nice to get an uh, opposition uh, view on things, and uh, I'm sure we'll be covering lots of topics that you will have, uh, no doubt, an opinion on. And It'd be nice to have a fresh face talk about it, rather than me and Carlo just whinging. <laughs> we'll move on uh, Carlo press conference um, I don't know if you managed to see it yeah. uh, as always Struber talked about energy uh, and belief and confidence that's never really been an issue has it um, I've just been looking at a stat the last four games 66 shots uh, resulting in four goals so confidence is not the issue neither is energy is the issue firepower um, yeah, I think if, if you look um, over the season, initially the problems were at the back. Um, January comes, um, you know, Solbauer comes in, defensively showed up quite a bit, good performance. I think Solbauer, not only, he, he stopped some of the mistakes, I think he, he's like a mentor at the back, isn't he? You know, Anderson looks a different player, uh, Jordan Williams looks a different player. But then up front, start, I'm not saying going wrong, I think... The longer you go without a goal, the confidence goes, doesn't it? And it's a vicious circle. And I think you saw, um, obviously, Woodrow was dropped for the Forest match. Um, and that's the first match of a long time where we had so many chances inside the box where you'd want Woodrow to be. So, obviously, he brought him back on. So, I think it's a confidence thing. But, if it, you know, the law of average says that if, if you have, like we did against Nottingham Forest, sort of 20 shots and was it eight, six or eight on target, you know, you'd hope one of them would go in. So, um, yeah. It's, um, it's a confidence thing with the strikers, but we'll get there, promise. Of course, of course. Uh, I think I've got poor internet connection. I'm sorry if I keep pausing. Uh, Billy, our manager spoke about it being a tough task, Brentford being a tough task. What's going to be tough about here? He, he mentioned that they've got a clear plan and a big fight, and uh, we know it's going to be hard against Brentford, but, but we're ready for him. How hard is it going to be for Barnsley against Brentford? Uh, and is there a plan to beat you guys? Is it possible? I mean, obviously it's possible because you know, we got beaten last Saturday by Stoke <laughs> City. You know, so uh, listen, you know, there's so many cliches flying around saying, you know, any, any team can beat any team in this league. And, and it's true. And the reason why is that, you know, it's not because it's a, it's a rubbish league. Is I actually think that the league has probably got more, more equal as time has gone on. Like, you know, you've got, you know, you've got good teams and not so good teams. Uh, at the beginning of the season, at Besotted, I mean, I co-edit Besotted.com, which is a blog and a podcast, and we do a pre-season um, summing up, in effect it is. So what we do is I go to all the bloggers for all up and down the country and ask them, how are you going to be doing up and down the country? How is your team going to do? How are other teams going to do? And you have to do a prediction as to which teams are going to get relegated. And I think maybe out of all the 24, probably about 21 put Barnsley down to be relegated. And I was one of the people that actually said, I don't think Barnsley are going to get relegated this season because I think they're good enough. The, the, the way that they play their football is good enough and I think they're going to be all right. And what's even worse, I'm not saying I want to get you to get relegated, is even about two or three weeks ago, I sent Carlo a little tweet, right? And I sent him not a little tweet, but a little video clip of the great escape. And even though you were like bottom of the league at the time, I said, trust me, Carlo, I've got a feeling you're going to get out of this. You're going to get out of this. And at the time, I mean, I had no idea that we were going to go on this ridiculous run of like, you know, eight matches and we're going to get sort of close to automatic. I just thought, let us just solidify our playoff place. Let us kind of win a few matches, lose a few matches and do whatever. But all of a sudden now, there's me, G and Carlo up. It's the final game of the season. You need to beat us. And in the back of my head, I'm thinking, actually, maybe it's my fault. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, Andy. Uh, we'll move on. Struber talked about the EFL and the decision. Um, you could do cast on that, could you not, Andy? You could probably do a series worth of podcasts on the EFL and decision-making. 
just sum it up where we're at with things. Uh, obviously, you guys have covered it in depth uh, over the past two, three months. <laughs> I was going to say days or weeks. It's been months. Um, just where we're at with things and, and just your thought process on that then, Andy. Well, we are still at an impasse. Um, the, the word is that Sheffield Wednesday, to name the closest one, um, have been through their litigation process and now we are at the appeal stage. But that appeals process could take up to 14 days. So even if there was an announcement, as we are on air right now, it still obviously isn't going to be completed until long after the games have finished. And Sheffield Wednesday's uh, chairman, uh, quite a litigious guy, uh, as is his wish, fair enough, uh, will fight for every tooth and nail to protect his football club. But Sheffield Wednesday were charged in November. November. So the fact that we are now in July... Uh, long past what would have ordinarily been clearly the end of the season is a, is a disgrace. It's ranking competence on the EFL's part. I know they've had a lot thrown at them, not just Sheffield Wednesday, Derby County, and other teams too have uh, got themselves into bother or at least are having to answer charges. And then there's the Wigan circumstance, uh, which is new in that respect too, as well as dealing with COVID-19. But November, really? <laughs> to get this far where... The match day will come and go on Wednesday and whatever the results of that match day, those relegated won't know where they stand. And that's wrong. It's interesting, yes. actually, because, uh, Andy, I mean, I was actually in a meeting with the EFL exactly a year ago now. It was actually the day before the, uh, the championship player final weekend last year. And it was uh, basically there's an, a delegation of fans goes to meet the EFL as part of the football Supporters Association, and uh, I was part of the, you know, I was part of that delegation. Um, you know, whole city fans, myself. There's about I think six or seven fans that go, and you, we sat there with, um, with, with all sort of top knobs in the in, in the in the EFL. Sean Harvey was there. Actually, it was his final uh, meeting before he was to leave the EFL. And uh, I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about um, about the, the the FFP situation and how certain clubs are or are not allowed to get away with with things in the EFL and I would do as a Brentford fan because we you know unfortunately every year or two years we have to keep on selling our players to ensure that we keep you know financially afloat as it is to make sure that we're actually not you know spending more than we're actually kind of um, you know spending more than we're actually getting in so we, we sold Malpay, we sold Andre Gray you know we keep selling players all the time and then you've got a situation where clubs could just go and spend what they want and then they're able to kind of pull a few little tricks to kind of sort of, uh, you know, to, to, to trick, you know, to the system. And I just thought this, this isn't right. So I'm not having to go at Wednesday or Derby or any clubs in particular, but I'm saying to them, surely we have a situation here where at one minute in the meeting, we're talking about Berry, and Berry have gone bust because their owner was doing all sorts of ridiculous things and spending money and they got them promoted. The next minute, the club doesn't exist anymore. Right. And then the fans are saying, you know, we would have rather if the owner hadn't spent money than us to have a bit of success for, you know, a year or two and then we don't exist. I said, surely as a body, you should be trying to stop this type of activity because it's great when it goes right, but there's only three teams that could get promoted from the championship and the other, uh, you know, uh, 20, 20, <laughs> 21, you know, they don't get promoted from the championship. So if you're not one of those three, if you're one of the other, say, 15, that are spending out of your, more than you could spend, eventually you're going to get into a bit of trouble. So surely as a, as a body, you should be stopping this type of activity. So as, lo as much as you might turn around and say, well, Sheffield Wednesday aren't doing anything wrong by selling this stadium to themselves, or Derby aren't doing anything wrong to sell the stadium to themselves, in principle, that is, that's kind of the wrong way of thinking about it. Surely you should be sort of kind of telling these clubs they need to temper how they're spending, and you should be in there making sure it doesn't happen so that, you know, Derby, from what I can gather, they possibly might be in a bit of trouble now financially because Mel's overspent. So for me, the, the situation with the EFL is that they need to be kind of getting these things into tow. And to be fair, you know, Parry's come in where Sean Harvey's gone out. Sean Harvey did seem to be a little bit kind of like, well, you know, at least they're spending money. You know, they're not kind of taking money out of the club, but they're still spending money on the players, which is, OK, that attitude does, is, is right. But I thought it was the wrong type of attitude. And I think that maybe Parry's coming in and things seem to be happening a little bit faster. And he seems to be putting the hammer down a little bit quicker than what was happening before. And uh, I think that may be the reason why things haven't happened so far is that they're kind of sort of unpicking 
a few things that maybe that happened with the previous regime and it's yeah. probably a little bit more difficult for them to sort of uh, kind of make things happen because of what was happening in the previous regime if you, if you well i i personally yeah absolutely i personally would agree with that i i am of the opinion and it's my opinion that uh, the best thing sean harvey did was the the draw for the l uh, for the EFL trophy when he took it overseas. Beyond that, uh, not a great deal. Uh, I, Rick Parry, whatever success he has uh, whilst in charge, I've come to the conclusion that football needs more independent regulation because whether it's the Premier League, the EFL as a group of teams in the Championship, a group of teams in League One and a group of teams in League Two, um, it's like a members club. So ultimately, you've got the, the boys and girls in charge of the other boys and girls, and you then have self-interest. So how all that is going to iron out? So, for example, Barnsley have taken issue with Sheffield Wednesday's circumstances. Fair enough. And they, they wrote a letter which benevolently, you'd have to say, from a fan's eye perspective, you have to agree with. But ultimately you can also turn that around and say, would Barnsley have made any noise whatsoever if they weren't as they were at the time at the bottom of the league? So there are all sorts of problems. What we've seen with the various different cases from Man City down through Sheffield Wednesday at the moment, whether they are able to win their case or not, um, a, huge, um, a huge look and review at regulation in football needs to take place. Place. And it, it, is, it is entirely correct, as you pointed out, that teams can sell their stadium to themselves or owners can do that. But you have to do it in the correct accountancy period um, and you have to do it to a company that existed at the time in the accountancy period you say it's going to. So the EFL and Rick Parry in a very difficult situation. So they will want, no doubt, to come down and show that they've got some teeth. They can't be seen to say, let Sheffield Wednesday off. And then if they do that, they're going to then perhaps be lenient with Derby County um, and the other problems there. Yet they have the competition or the, the integrity, for want of a better word, of the competition to try and protect as well. And ultimately, it would appear all of those factors taken into account, it stifled them to the point where it's dragged on for eight, nine months. Yeah, yeah. I told you it were a can of worms, Carl, didn't I? I Can I just say, Bamboo Diaby has been suspended since January and we're still waiting to hear. But anyway, Chris, I next know. question. I know. <laughs> and, I, and I agree on the Bamboo thing. It's a massive issue for that young man. It's a massive issue for Barnsley. But there's much bigger issues, isn't there? And they're not being solved. So how would you expect them to solve something no. like that? that you know, I think uh, it's uh, a, very, very similar to what Andy's easy. just mentioned. At the minute, it feels like, you know, for them to change financial fair play rules and to rewrite rules to suit everybody. And for it to be fair, it would be like a turkey voting for Christmas at this minute in time. Would, it, would that be fair to say, Andy? I would, yeah, wholeheartedly agree with that. And, well, football, sadly, has always been a, a meritocracy to a point, but now more starker than ever, the haves and the have-nots or the difference between the haves and the have-nots are uh, even greater, aren't they? So God, when Barnsley got promoted to, to the Premier League under Danny, it was a wonderful achievement um, that is still celebrated to this day. But the financial odds, and the financial odds were stacked against them, that they were probably slightly more in their favour than, say, the current Barnsley team and their owners, despite the wealth uh, of the owners, because whoever gets relegated from the Premier League this year, last year, and, and going forward until they scrap it, are going to get an unbelievable amount of money that teams like Barnsley just won't really be able to compete with. I, th I think that also, you know, what you say is that um, it's interesting because uh, Barnsley, uh, it, it, the EFL itself, it's, uh, you talked about independent uh, body coming in, and I think you're totally right because the thing is that, again, I'm not sitting down there, I, I think that you've got to give praise where praise is due, wherever it may be, and, you know, EFL, FA, you know, the Premier League, they're great at doing a number of things, okay? Um, a number of things are really, really good at doing it. And what you have to focus, I think what they need to focus on is the game itself, is football itself, because that is where their expertise is, is that how do you develop the game of football? What do you do with football in itself? And I think that these other issues that come in, the financial side of things, you know, all this kind of legal side of things, which is a bit of a sidetrack, and it's not what they're really good at. It's like having a football club who decides they're going to put a hotel and then a restaurant and then a this and then a, an aircraft, and they own all these other things. <laughs> Mr. Club. Lee will like that. Yeah, <laughs> you can land on Pontefract. No, shouldn't you concentrate on football? Yeah. So it's like yeah. with the EFL, 
concentrate on football, get an independent body to kind of sort out everything else and it will make their life so much easier and everyone will be so much happier. Billy, that's perfectly summed up there. And as Billy's mentioned, let's get back to the football. Let's focus on the football. Uh, we, we've opened up a can of worms. We could have another episode on that, <laughs> without doubt. Uh, Carlo, uh, Struber talked about style. Uh, he talked about our, our, our style will affect Brentford's style and the fact that it may cause them issues. He also talked about big results already in London. He's just drawing on all the positives, is he not? We're not really going to beat him, are we? Not really I, got a chance. I, I think what he's done, and, and that's, that's very clever, is he's referred to the fact that, you know, we've done the double over Fulham and we went to London where traditionally Barnsley struggle and we got a result. We went to QPR the first game after lockdown and we got a result. Um, and I think, listen, I know they're just words, but I think for some of these players, maybe that's what they need to hear. You know, the plan, um, the execution against uh, Leeds and against Forest. You could almost see that there was there was huge pressure, wasn't there? There was huge pressure to try and win against Leeds, which we didn't do when the same against against Forest. But it's almost like it's a lose or bust situation. Literally, it's I don't want to say the word because sometimes kids watch this, but we, we, you have to go for it. And anything positive that he can say to to gear these players up even more, you know, he will do. I think, and and, and I've assisted with that even under Daniel Stendhal, that when Barnsley is at it. And they played at high press and at high intensity. I think no matter what club they are in this league, they will struggle. Leeds struggled. We've seen Fulham struggle be at home and away. West Brom, I think, took a point of us this season. So we've shown that against these better teams, we can do it. It's a time to do it one last time. Um, and let's hope it's not the last match um, at the stadium for them because they've got a playoff after us, you know, after, after tomorrow. Put it that yes. way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Andy, you and I. I'd have to disagree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andy, you and I spoke uh, on uh, Gerhard Struber's unveiling or press conference, so to speak. We had a nice coffee. It was a lovely afternoon. It was. You won't expect from then to be where we are now, uh, let alone what month we're in. Forget that. Nobody could have foresaw, foresaw that. But in terms of us being a point, well, what, what one result adrift effectively we're still in it with one game to go. Nobody saw that coming. We sat in press, we sat in press box December thinking Barnsley were a League One team. Struber's done magnificent, hasn't it? To, to think we're still in with a, a fighting chance. Oh, he's, he's done a superb job. The, the odds have been greatly stacked against him. Um, Daniel Stendel, I'm personally still a fan, but tactically naive perhaps at the start of the the championship season and wasn't helped by uh, Barnsley's recruitment over the course of the summer um, or it perhaps departures as well as recruitment in into the football club. So since that time, I, I think the form has been about mid-table, upwards of mid-table form uh, to keep Barnsley in with with a shout of all of that. And we, we kind of took the view that he would organise the team, uh, maybe sort out one or two of the, the players that just weren't up to it. But the, the reality is the form has been has been excellent, hasn't it? And had they have made their decision quicker, and I don't necessarily mean in, in moving Daniel Stendhal on when they clearly had issues in, in how one team wanted that recruitment to progress and the other. I mean, just not take six weeks to appoint Struber having, having uh, pushed Daniel Stendhal yeah. uh, out of the door, then Barnsley might not be in this situation. They, they may be better off and not needing to go into a last day game down at Brentford. And, and that's, and that's the, the massive frustration. Um, you, you highlighted there a load of games this season where Barnsley are being superb, absolutely superb. The West Brom game, I think, was under Adam Murray. But clearly, there are players in that team of quality that the season has been essentially mismanaged until Struber. Yes, yeah, Andy, you're right. I've just looked at stats. We'd be 12 on Struber's, Struber's points alone. From, we started league when Barnsley got Struber, we'd be 12. So that impact is absolutely massive. Tremendous. Uh, as you've said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Billy, He's done a pressure. Super job. Billy, let's talk about pressure. Uh, <laughs> pressure was mentioned uh, in the press conference numerous times. There's pressure on both teams. Um, that could be to Barnsley's detriment. You guys need a result. Uh, how do you feel it's going to play out? Who do you think is going to be able to handle that pressure uh, better, really, I mean, given the we're circumstances? Both, we're both yeah. We listen. We're both under pressure. We know that. Uh, I'll be honest with you, the, the, the pressure was really felt last weekend. I mean, it wasn't only the players, but the fans, you know, Friday night, 
you know, we watched that um, West Brom, um, the, the West Brom match, which was uh, against Huddersfield, which was truly tremendous. It was like better than any Brentford game that we'd ever seen, you know, you know Brentford fans all over West London, all over the world were just jumping around, you know, and just celebrating when that, um, when Emil um, scored that final goal for Huddersfield, it's fantastic. So all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, it's on. If we win our match tomorrow, we are literally just an inch away from Premier League. So I, I couldn't, I didn't eat on Friday night. I couldn't sleep on Friday night. <laughs> Saturday morning, I got up at five o'clock in the morning and I sent a sneaky WhatsApp. I thought, let me send a WhatsApp to the group. You know, there's about 70 people in our WhatsApp group. I sent a little WhatsApp to them. And when they wake up, they can reply. Bing, send it at five o'clock. I got a reply immediately from somebody. And then somebody else, bing, and then another person, bing, bing. No one could sleep. You know what I'm saying? That 20 replies, like, you know, at five o'clock in the morning. So, you know, we had the pressure on. So you can imagine that the players had the pressure on as well. And when we played against Stoke, uh, they just I mean, they just didn't start well. They didn't perform. To be fair to Stoke, and like I said, you've always got to give respect to the teams that you're playing as well. They actually played brilliantly. Defensively, they were organised. They were solid. They had us down pat. They, they didn't give us any space to do our thing. Our creative players who could normally break out, Ben Rama could break out and have a little shot from 20 yards or does a little one-two and then gets a player into the area and we score. The, yeah. None of that was happening because they really did have us. And it was a combination of pressure. It was a combination of the way Stoke were playing and, you know, we were tired. There's just so many combinations. And as you've probably seen, when you... When you have bad results, all of a sudden the fans go, you know, on social media, it just goes mad and people just think it's the end of the world. And it really was the end of the world for, for Brentford on, on Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, Sunday. And then people sat back. And if, like I said, if you listen to our podcast on Pride of West dot London as well, you kind of sat back for a couple of days and you think about things. You think, hold on a second. We've just won eight games in a row. We've let in, what, two goals in those eight games. We scored, what, 20, 20 odd goals in that eight games. You don't become a bad team overnight. We've had a bad day. You know, we've had a couple of games where, to be quite honest with you, they weren't that great, but we got away with it. But then yeah. Leeds United have done the same thing. You know, Leeds United struggled against you guys. They struggled against Cardiff. They struggled against Luton. You know, you can't play that game all the time. But what you do when you're a half-decent side, you work out how you can get past your Charlton's. When Charlton come and they've got you locked down for 60 minutes or 70 minutes, you can't get through. Then all of a sudden you get that breakthrough. And that's kind of what we've noticed is the difference with Brentford now than they were even one or two. I remember you came down to Brentford in your first season down up in the championship a few seasons ago. And we were doing all right that season. And then you came down and you beat us 1-0 because you did what you had to do, bang, bang, and you kipped us. And we were like, whoa, because we hadn't really discovered the true art of just sometimes just grinding out a win when you needed to grind it out. And so coming back to this point about pressure, listen, there's going to be pressure on both of us, um, you know, and we know the implications of it. And I think that if anything, I would like to think that the guys having the pressure last Saturday, they're feeling like I am now, because at the moment now I ain't feeling any pressure at all because I think it's gone. I think that opportunity we had is gone. So I'm not, I'm not going to be waking up at five o'clock in the morning pinging WhatsApps to my mates now because I'm going to get a nice sleep tonight. I'm going to go to the game tomorrow. I'm going to be expecting nothing to happen. And if something does happen, it's going to be an absolute and total surprise. You know, if we beat you, yeah. that's what is expected. If we don't, I'll be a bit gutted. But then we were in the playoffs, which is what I expected at the beginning of lockdown anyway. Of and uh, like I said to you, if we get a result, I'm going to be like, yes, and West Brom draw then I'm going to be like, this is fantastic. And literally there'll be casualties in uh, the Brentford area all night and tomorrow morning. And I'll be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to happen. Pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We shall see. We shall see. Uh, Carlo, striker talk. Uh, and I'm not talking about Cross Keys, number one striker, uh, Miss L. Oh. Uh, we're talking about <laughs> Elliot Simoes, yeah. who is now fit again yeah. uh, to play. Um, where do we go from there? Woodrow didn't start the last game. Smith didn't start the last game, uh, but our goal came from a Woodrow cross, a Brown header, and a Schmidt finish. Uh, Chaplin did start, zero shots on target in that 90 minutes. So who's your front three, Carl? What, what is our, our best front three? Have we got a front three? Um, I, I keep swapping and changing. Um, I do think, um, given the number of chances we created early on against Forrest, I do think he'll start with Woodrow. Um, he's, he, he's dropped Chaplin before. I'm just, I'm just wondering. Um, I think Simba West in that number ten role, and uh, you know, we'll draw football with Brown because they both got that bit of height. Um, I'd like to see Simba West start. He's one of those uh, younger players coming through, and 
you know, sometimes when a young player comes through, you sort of hold your breath and be like, mm. but Romal Palmer came in, did excellent. We saw uh, yeah. Matty Wolf come in um, against uh, Forrest, did amazingly. You know, Aidan Marsh is knocking on the doors. And these are kids at 80, 90 year old. And I think Simoes, um, he's got something, hasn't he? So um, ideally, I'll be honest, um, if, if he plays down the left, I'd, I'd like him to see like, linking up with Clark O'Dor. We saw that once earlier this season. And every Barnsley fan were going, that's where the next money is, you know. We said it last season about Ethan Pinnock. That's where our money is. And this season, we're talking about Odor. We're talking about Simo West. So, um, I'd start Simo West in the 10 role with Brown and Woodrow up front. And you keep Chaplin on the bench for any impact because you know the impact he can have. Assuming Simo West is, is fit to play 90 yeah. minutes, but I think they've done well to, to be able to get him, him fit enough to play at all, Andy, have they not? It's a quick turnaround, yeah. that, isn't it? It sounds like a miracle. It's only a couple of press conferences ago that he was out for up to six weeks. So whatever yeah. they've done and whatever, whatever, I mean, he's young, so he should recover quickly. But from six weeks to a couple of days is quite extraordinary. Yeah. But great news that he's playing. He's earned his stripes. He should play tomorrow uh, down at uh, Brentford for, for my money as, as well. He's had, a, he's had a big impact, the youngster, no question. Of course, of course. We mentioned Schmidt coming off the bench and scoring Carlo. Twice he's done that this season. Come off the bench, scored a winner. Three times He's now. the first Barnsley player to do it since who, Carlo? Oh, not you, <laughs> not you, is it? I didn't know it was a quiz. Go on, I would, I would have rehearsed. First, first, first time it's happened since who? Jason Scotland. J oh, there you yeah, go. they used to bring Jason Scotland on. Yeah, what yeah, yeah, yeah. There we um, go. Listen, Schmidt, um, just really quickly, the mental strength that lads must have to oh, come from yeah. Austria to be a regular sub, but whenever he's called upon, I know he doesn't have many touches, and people say, oh, he never touches the ball, but when he does, it, this is what he does. And it almost is like he doesn't need that confidence. He doesn't need to be on 12, 13 goals to be able to put the next one in, because he, the, the one chance he gets, he tends to put it in, doesn't he? Of course, of course. Guys, we'll can, move on to predictions and scorelines. Go on, Billy. I was just going to say... I, I, from a, from a game point of view, actually, I think it's going to be actually a really good game because the, the style of football that you play, you play possession football, you take long shots, you try and control the game in the opposition's half, so you press it quite high. And this is the type of game that actually we like as well, you know, as opposed to, you know, teams like Stoke City, maybe Millwall, who sit a lot deeper. You know, you find it hard to break them down and then they hit you on the break. So this actually could be an interesting game. And like, you know, you guys... I think that you play good football. I think the problem may have been you actually finishing and you scoring your goals. But also, at times, when you do score, you know, you, you play absolutely brilliantly. So it could be one of those games where people presume, because we're up there and you're down there, you know, it should be a given. But I don't think so at all. I think that, you know, the style of football we both play, it actually could pan out to be a really, really good game, a really good open game. And, uh, and we, we ain't under any doubt that you guys could give us some problems because you... You know, you've got some good players in your side. Okay, so they're young, they're raw, they might make mistakes, but also they're hungry and, uh, and they're enthusiastic. And sometimes that's just not what you need. Sometimes you want a, a kind of team full of Birmingham City players, you know, who, <laughs> who get paid lots of money and don't really care. You know, that's, we'd ideally love to be playing Birmingham City now, but instead we're playing Barnsley and you're in a lower position than them, but you've got more chance of giving us a game. So it should be quite interesting. School prediction, I've been saying 2-0 all of this lockdown period and I'm going to go 2-0 yet again. Um, my prediction is, um, I think Barnsley will nick it, but I don't think it'll be enough. I think Luton might get a result against Blackburn, and I think someone else, I mean, I'm hoping not, but maybe Leeds, if they've been on the celebratory champagne, might not put a performance in that we'd expect them to do against Charlton. Um, I just want, if we're going to go down, I want to go down fighting. So I'm going for a win, and to make it really ironic, it'll come off Ethan Pinnock's thigh in the 89th minute. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, Andy Giddens, your prediction? Well, all football logic says that Brentford are going to win. And it's interesting talking about pressure. Because of that football logic, I would say that all of the pressure is on Brentford. They have got far more to lose. They essentially have an open goal, so the stats suggest, to beat a team struggling to stay in the championship, um, to give themselves a chance of achieving automatic promotion to the Premier League. Um, I take the point about it being an attractive game. I think it will. I think Barnsley will give a, a fantastic account of themselves. Um, part of me actually rather cheekily thinks it might be a draw uh, down at uh, Griffin Park, perhaps, perhaps because of that uh, pressure. But uh, it's interesting you mentioned Jason Scotland. Well, Jason Scotland, didn't he score in the match at Huddersfield? 
on that dramatic day a few years ago when uh, when <sighs> the Reds stayed up or they both stayed up. Uh, Brian Howard, scorer of a goal that caused a major upset in Barnsley history when yep. they went to Anfield and beat Liverpool in the FA Cup. So I sit here with fingers crossed that there's something a bit like that. Yes, they're relying on results elsewhere, but you know what? Stranger things have happened at sea. Brilliant. Uh, my prediction, I think we're going to get absolutely battered. I think Jack Walton's going to be wonderful and he's going to save everything and then we're going to pinch <laughs> it pinch it right at the end. Just a quick stat on Jack Walton. We didn't get around to speaking about key players. I thought you might find this interesting, Andy. Uh, Walton's the second highest clean sheet ratio in the history uh, at this level for Barnsley, at 54%. Uh, there's only one, one, one goalkeeper higher than him, uh, Matthew Ghent, who... Uh, we only played one game and we were already relegated. <laughs> uh, so well, there you that's go. That's my preparation for tomorrow then. So <laughs> I was due to no. start it afterwards anyway. So thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Gents, thank you very much for joining us. Billy, thanks for joining us. That's all good. Thanks for having me and, you know, enjoy the game tomorrow evening, but not too much, I guess. It's a real <laughs> shame. It's a real shame we couldn't be there because knowing the Barnsley away supporters... I think we would have sold, I think it's 1,600 or whatever. And, you know, we always travel well. And Brentford is one of those sides, and I've been before, where we're always really welcomed as well. So, let's say, if Barnsley can win tomorrow, yeah. I pray for you to win the playoffs. Everybody's happy. Yeah, OK. Thanks there a lot, guys. Go. No worries, buddy. Andy, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Any time. Fingers crossed it goes the Reds' way tomorrow. And it is a shame that no fans are going to be there tomorrow. What an occasion that, that would be. Obviously, Brentford's last time there as well. It would be tremendous, but uh, sadly not. But fingers crossed it goes the Reds' way. Who's travelling for you guys? Uh, is it Adam or yourself or Mike? No, I'm, uh, I'm going down tomorrow and uh, Brian Howard uh, will, be, uh, will be sat alongside me as the good luck charm. <laughs> good man. Safe journey then, Andy. Thank you. No problem. Carlo, thank you very much for joining me on our podcast. It's, it's yeah. a pleasure as always. Pleasure is all by, mate. Pleasure is all by. I'm going to see <laughs> if you're leaving us up now. <laughs> Too right. Say hi to everybody. Thank you very much for watching. Ta-ra. Cheers, Thanks. Billy. Good luck tomorrow. Cheers.